Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for, for having me here at your summer school. Well, so it's an exobiology summer school. I thought I'd talk about life detection a little bit. And um, I assume this is something we're all interested in, in our various different contexts. And indeed, well, let me first introduce myself before I get into that, since, since I don't know most of you. So I'm British, as you can tell. I'm sorry for my accent. I'm sorry for Brexit. I'm sorry for many things. <laughs> Uh, my training is in geology and paleontology and geomicrobiology. I'm interested in fossil bacteria, the chemistry and microbiology of fossilization, and planetary biosignatures generally. Um, and if you're interested in finding out more about uh, the work that my group does, you can follow this link. This, by the way, is my wife Diana, and this is my dog Violet. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> let's, let's take another look. <laughs> Okay, so life detection is obviously a central goal in astrobiology. Whether we're talking about Mars or the very early Earth, where we're looking for the oldest evidence of life on our own planet, or whether we're talking about icy moons in the outer solar system, like Europa, Enceladus, or indeed exoplanets. Uh, you might think it needs a definition of life, but I don't think it necessarily does. I mean, I can look for a chair, I can recognize a chair without having thought about the definition of a chair. But in reality, in most of these contexts, what we're actually looking for is not necessarily life itself that you can hold in your hand and, and poke and so on, but proxies for life. Uh, so lines of evidence that give us some more or less direct or indirect uh, indication that life is or was present. And that's partly why this is difficult. So these proxies we call biosignatures. You may have heard this term many times before. There are various definitions out there in the literature. A popular one is that a biosignature is an object, substance, and or pattern whose origin specifically requires a biological agent. So this is what we might think of as a strong definition, where if something's a biosignature, it must be produced by life. There are other slightly weaker definitions. And here are just a few examples of some of the things that we might come across or think about as biosignatures. I mean, a dinosaur skeleton, I don't think anybody would believe there is any non-biological process that could make that. A DNA molecule, often talked about as a kind of chemical equivalent. And then this here is uh, what's called the vegetation red edge, which is a feature of the reflectant spectrum of uh, vegetation and photosynthetic organisms generally, uh, which I'll talk a, a little bit more about later. But you can see this from space, and it tells you that there's plants on the Earth, essentially. Now, these, these latter two, maybe you can get to DNA without life. Maybe there was DNA formed abiotically before the origin of life, strictly speaking, in which case maybe just a DNA molecule by itself doesn't require a biological agent. Maybe you can get features like this in the reflectance spectrum of a, of a planetary body that just have to do with minerals on the surface. There are semiconductor minerals that have quite a similar reflectance profile, for example. So although these things and many others in astrobiology that are talked about as, as biosignatures may or may not be good evidence for life in a certain context, uh, we shouldn't run away with the idea that these sorts of things necessarily require a biological agent. It does depend on the context. So I'm going to go through a few examples of the things that we talk about as biosignatures in astrobiology um, in, in different contexts. So if we're looking at the, uh, the transmission spectrum of the atmosphere of a planet, you can see absorption features due to various molecular uh, species present in the, in the atmosphere. And in the case of the Earth, unlike Mars or Venus, you can see oxygen and also ozone. And also this marked uh, presence of carbon dioxide and ozone, and there's even methane as well. So you have not just oxygen, but also a disequilibrium between oxygen and other things that oxygen is not really stable in the presence of that implies some kind of process that's producing oxygen as well as these other things. Um, so that's one example of something that's talked about as a biosignature. A little bit more about the, the vegetation red edge that I showed before. Um, this is a kind of idealized picture of it, but you can get a spectrum very much like this if you just take any, any leaf, put it, put it in a reflectant spectrometer. Vegetation and, and photosynthetic organisms generally tend to absorb um, radiation in the visible part of the spectrum, which is photosynthetically active, they need that for photosynthesis, they tend to reflect in the infrared, and you get this very sharp discontinuity because of that. 
and then often you get a little bump around 500 na nanometers which is the green chlorophyll but that that profile is telling you something about uh, about the fact that the organism you're looking at is, is a photosynthesizing organism in 1990 when the Galileo spacecraft was heading away from the earth um, Carl Sagan and others I guess persuaded NASA to point it back towards the earth and they obtained reflectance spectra from the earth and from different regions of the earth and you could see in that same region of the spectrum some of these edges uh, like that which they argued were a biosignature for life on the presence of the earth so um, whereas this was about the transmission spectrum of the atmosphere this is this is about the the light that's reflected off the surface of the planet and potentially you could see this on an exoplanet maybe if the atmosphere was opti optically transparent enough if your spectral resolution of your space telescope was high enough and so on uh, in microbiology uh, and when we're studying extreme environments to look for analogues of the sorts of organisms that might survive on Mars we often rely on a very different type of biosignature which is um, essentially sequencing the genomes of the organisms in the environment and we can go to places that are in some ways analogous to extreme environments on Mars like the dry valleys of Antarctica which are very cold very low water activity we can find microorganisms like these endolithic cyanobacteria living inside the rocks as well as other bacteria we can sequence their genomes uh, using modern molecular biology techniques and this gives us a lot of information about life in these extreme environments now on Mars we don't expect organic molecules to be or at least <coughs> biologically distinctive organic molecules to survive very well in near surface conditions uh, but there are these uh, hypotheses that the deep subsurface of Mars could be could be habitable and maybe one day we'll drill deep into the subsurface and access living Martian ecosystems that's probably a long way off if that ever happens uh, in the meantime our missions like the Perseverance rover and the ExoMars if it ever happens have to focus on the study of rocks from ancient environments on Mars that were relatively habitable compared to Mars today and they try to access rocks and minerals that have been somewhat protected from the harsh radiation environment for example by drilling below the surface and extracting extracting material that can then be be analyzed um, so but a lot of the focus now is on geological biosignatures so let's think about some of the kind of optimistic scenarios for things we might find uh, in sort of four billion year old rocks on Mars and things that we do find in ancient rocks on on the earth well there's fossils and under some circumstances even bacteria can fossilize these are some fossil cyanobacteria these are only about 400 million years old but you can see the the shapes of the cells and the way they cluster together they look a lot like modern cyanobacteria you can go in and analyze the composition of the original carbonaceous material that composes these there are much older examples as well you can find you can find these in rocks maybe three and a half billion years old although they tend to get a bit controversial when you go that far back when lots of microorganisms get together into a community and cover a sediment surface they often produce distinctive patterns and textures at the sediment water interface here's a, a fossil example this is kind of what it would have looked like this is from the Ediacaran of Newfoundland in Canada so um, 560 million years ago it would have looked something like this a, a kind of green carpet around a beach or just below the, the um, top of the water column on, on the sediment floor and the green carpet was peeling a little bit maybe it was drying out in the sun and cracking and it was peeling back from the edges and this whole thing is, is fossilized so that's what we might call a microbially induced sedimentary structure or a fossil microbial mat and then we have these things called stromatolites that you may have come across so these these are some living examples from from Shark Bay in Western Australia and th these are sort of columns and domes produced by again photosynthesizing microorganisms that grow up towards towards the light and they mediate the precipitation of particularly carbonate minerals they also trap and bind sediment particles which means that as they're growing they're kind of forming a rock they're sometimes called living rocks and um, these are very common fossils in the Precambrian rocks of the earth uh, but they often have the same kind of um, columnar shape various other shapes they tend to take as well so these these uh, are among the oldest lines of evidence that we have for life on earth um, and very optimistically maybe we'll find them on Mars I should say it's not necessarily 
It's not just cyanobacteria that, that can make these. There's other types of photosynthesizing organisms that can do it as well. Then there's uh, stable isotopic biosignatures. We've heard quite a lot about isotopes already this morning. Um, just to pick a, a, a different system than carbon, there are bacteria that will reduce sulfate to sulfide, and there is an isotopic fractionation associated with that, such that the sulfide that they produce is isotopically lighter than the sulfate that they started with. So it's got uh, proportionally less of the 34 sulfur isotope and more of the 32 sulfur isotope. Whereas the, sulf the sulfate that's left behind is then proportionally heavier. Uh, and the nice thing about sulfide is it will often precipitate as a mineral whose isotopic composition you can then measure and it can stick around for a long time in the rock record. And you, can, you measure it relative to a standard using this notation. And just to give you one example, um, a couple of years ago, I studied some gypsum veins from England. <coughs> and I did that partly because we know there are gypsum veins on, on Mars, which formed in quite a similar way to these ones from England. And at the margins of the gypsum veins, this is a reflected light micrograph, you could see these shiny pyrites that had grown around the edges of the, of the sulfate. And I found that the isotopic composition of the sulfide mineral, the pyrite, at the margins of these veins was much lighter than the, the sulfate, the gypsum that was making up most of the, of the vein. And there was some organic matter associated with these as well. So that might be a biosignature. It might be evidence that at least in these sulfate veins in England, millions of years ago underground, there were organisms that were reducing the sulfate, um, precipitating sulfide minerals. Maybe this is a sort of thing that we might hope to find on Mars. Then the, there's organic matter itself, which I've already mentioned. Now, some forms of organic matter preserve very well in Earth's rock record. In particular, the kind of refractory cores of membrane lipids of bacteria. So this is a bacterial membrane lipid. And derived from it are these things called hoponoids, which are, which are very common, what we call biomarkers uh, in Earth's sedimentary rocks. They can survive for hundreds of millions of years. And you can extract them with acids from the rock. You dissolve away the rock matrix. And if you don't want to dissolve away the rock matrix, you can also study fossil organic matter from ancient organisms in situ using a range of different techniques. One of them is vibrational spectroscopy. Well, that's really more than one technique. But just for example, here is, here is some, some fossil organic matter, again from, from the UK. This, this is uh, actually from, uh, from a famous fossil assemblage called the Rhiney Chert in Scotland. And these are sort of fungal spores fossilized inside this transparent silica matrix. And if you, if you use a technique called uh, Fourier transform infrared spectroscopy with this material, you can obtain uh, spectra in which there are peaks corresponding to different organic moieties in the organic matter, and you can characterize it. And you can even see differences in the organic composition of different organisms fossilized in this rock unit. And then just for completeness, there's also biominerals. So minerals that, that are formed directly by the activity of microorganisms. A classic example would be the little magnetite crystals that are formed inside magnetotactic bacteria. These have a very particular size and shape and crystal structure. Um, you can find them in sediments. There's some argument about how reliable that is as a biosignature, whether non-biological processes can make them too. Um, and this on the right is a, is, a, is a calcium phosphate plate secreted by a eukaryotic microorganism again millions of years ago. So maybe you could find things like this preserved in rocks on Mars, again very optimistically. Now all of those things we've talked about are very specific to life on Earth. There's this idea out there that you may have come across that we could also look for biosignatures of radically different forms of life. And one idea is that rather than focusing on the specific chemistry or the specific uh, uh, isotopic anomaly or whatever it is, we should look for complexity in some form and complexity might be the key biosignature. There's different ways of measuring complexity. And there's a lot of work on this in information theory which astrobiologists have recently started drawing on. One of them has to do with how many steps you have to go through to make something. So if you think about a complex molecule, forget for a moment the actual composition of that molecule and just represent it as a kind of string of, of units, you can count the number of steps you need to make where you put units together to make that string. If your string is a DNA molecule, it's a lot of steps. If your string is coat, coat, corn, corn, it's uh, 
what, four steps or something. So this gives you a way to quantify the complexity of, of a molecule, which might work as a biosignature regardless of what the molecule actually is. If you have a very high abundance of a very complex material, it's going to require some very specific chemical pathways to make it. That's the idea anyway. So all of that was very optimistic, and these are the sorts of things that astrobiologists like to, like to imagine that we're going to find on Mars and in other places where we're looking for life. But the reality is that life detection is really difficult. And it's difficult for a number of reasons. Firstly, we don't really know exactly what we're looking for. We don't know if it exists. We don't know if life actually exists on Mars or in the icy moons or wherever. And if it does exist, we don't know what it's going to look like. So this is a suboptimal set of conditions for looking for something. In particular, there's a, a large risk of, of two kinds of, of errors, essentially. It could be that there is a biosignature actually present or there is life actually present in some, in some setting, but we're not able to detect it, and we might get a false negative result in our search. Or it could be that there isn't any sign of life actually present in that environment, but we make a misinterpretation and we think there is, and that would be a false positive error. And in the history of astrobiology, unfortunately, these false positive errors have been rather common, and this applies both to the study of the earliest life on Earth and uh, the search for life elsewhere. So I'm going to go through some examples. Some of these are a bit, um, you've probably heard about them before, but I'm going to try and think about what lessons we can draw from them. This part of the talk is going to come across as a bit negative, and I'm sorry about that. And I want to stress, I don't mean to criticize anybody. This is really hard. It's really difficult to try and find evidence of life. Everybody's doing their best. I'm not criticizing anybody, okay? <laughs> Okay, so a classic example would be uh, the American astronomer Percival Lowell, who um, built this fantastic observatory in Arizona and pointed his amazing telescope at Mars and thought that on the surface of Mars he could discern all of these lines, many of them kind of paired. Um, and he thought these were canals built by intelligent Martians. Sometimes people say that this was nobody took him seriously, but actually some people did take him seriously. Uh, you know, he never really there was never really a consensus in the scientific community that this was that there was definitely a civilization on Mars. But people did take this seriously, partly because he had the best telescope in the world. And one of the people who took him seriously was uh, was Thomas Huxley, quite a well-known British scientist who played a big role in debates around evolution in the 19th century. And he took the trouble to write this book called Is Mars Habitable? Which concluded, no, Mars is not habitable. Uh, for a number of reasons. Mars cannot possibly have um, a temperature as high as the freezing point of water. Uh, animal life, especially its higher forms, cannot exist on the planet, so you can't have canals built by intelligent beings. Mars, therefore, is not only uninhabited by intelligent beings, such as Mr. Lowell postulates, but is absolutely uninhabitable. It's worth highlighting that the kind of reasoning that Huxley was deploying here is, is still relevant to us today. He was making the case that it can't be a biosignature if the environment is not habitable. And this is still an important consideration. And of course, as it turned out, as our images of the surface of Mars improved, those uh, things that looked like canals just kind of steadily disappeared. <laughs> um, and in the 1970s, Carl Sagan and, and, uh, and colleagues reflected that although a small number of those features that had been described as canals might correspond to real features of Mars, uh, like valleys or ridges or craters, most of them actually had no real relation to the Martian surface. So why people were seeing these has something to do with the limitations of their telescopes, the human tendency to see patterns where there aren't any, maybe some kind of optical effects um, that aren't yet fully understood. But the lesson we can draw from this is not to overinterpret weak signals, I guess. And again, it's not a biosignature if the environment's not habitable. In the 1950s, another Harvard astronomer, as it happens, thought that he could detect features due to absorption by organic molecules in the reflectance spectrum of Mars. And he published uh, a couple of papers describing these as evidence of vegetation. They seem to be especially associated with the dark regions of Mars, because as you know, Mars has darker and lighter regions. And he noticed that these features seem more prominent um, when the light was collected from the darker areas than from the lighter areas. And he thought that these features around three microns were due, as I, as I was saying there, to, to organic molecules, and particularly to things like chlorophyll. Uh, 
Now this was kind of a big deal at the time and Joshua Lederberg, Nobel Prize winning scientist who played a really important role in establishing the NASA exobiology program, thought that this was actually pretty good evidence for the possible presence of life or at least some sort of organic material on Mars. In fact, these features were due to deuterium in the atmosphere of the Earth along the line of sight to Mars at the time the observations were taken and had nothing to do with organic material on Mars whatsoever. Now the problem here is that uh, Sinton simply hadn't thought of this. And again, you know, that's fair enough. You wouldn't necessarily think of this unless you happen to be studying the spectrum of deuterium. Um, but we should beware of things we haven't thought of. And we should also beware of terrestrial contamination with any sampling procedure. Are we really looking at Mars or are we looking at Earth or something from Earth that's got in the way? Another very famous cautionary tale that you've probably all heard of um, is, is the story of the Martian meteorite ALH84001 that was recovered from Antarctica in 1984. And then in 1996, this paper was published describing what seemed to be a number of lines of evidence for ancient life on Mars preserved within this meteorite. And I remember, because uh, I'm old enough, Bill Clinton was standing on the lawn of the White House giving a press conference um, declaring that, you know, this was a great triumph for America's space program and it was a really exciting thing. And some people think this, this discovery played a, an important role in the, in the establishment of the NASA Astrobiology Institute. But anyway, so there were various lines of evidence in this meteorite. There were things that looked like tiny little fossils, although I missed the scale off here, but these were nanometer scale things, but they looked kind of like bacteria. There were polyaromatic hydrocarbons, which at the time were interpreted as the remains of, or possibly, possibly the remains of biological organic material. There were these globules of carbonate that were interpreted as a product of microbial uh, respiration. And there were even little magnetite crystals that looked somewhat like those uh, bacterially produced magnetite crystals I showed earlier. So here they seem to have multiple lines of evidence. It wasn't just one thing. They seem to have multiple lines of evidence, all agreeing that there was evidence of life on early Mars. But what's happened is that one by one, each of those lines of evidence has turned out to have a simpler explanation that maybe actually fits the data a bit better. So the structures that look like fossil cells seem to be something to do with uh, the edges of crystal lattices combined with uh, the stuff that's used to coat these for, for electron microscopy. The carbonate globules have now been explained in terms of hydrothermal uh, alteration that precipitates carbonate minerals. The little magnetite crystals are, are, can be interpreted as the product of the shock decomposition of iron carbonates uh, during an impact event. The polyaromatic hydrocarbons, uh, there are actually other complex molecules as well, but those are probably contamination from the Earth. But we can understand pretty well now how you can get fairly large uh, aromatic compounds on Mars through various abiotic synthesis pathways. Work on this continues. There was a very recent paper showing that some of the organic material in this meteorite is very closely localized to, to mineralogical evidence of serpentinization, um, which should all make sense to you already given what you've, what you've heard this morning and I gather from your previous uh, lectures on the origin of life. We know that where you have water rock reactions in the presence of CO2, you can reduce CO2, you can make organic material. So I, the jury is, I'm not saying this is completely dismissed. There are still people who, who would argue that altogether this does look like evidence of life on Mars. But I think, speaking for myself and most of the people I talk to, we don't really regard this anymore as being good evidence of life on Mars. So you can have multiple lines of evidence, but if they're all ambiguous, you, don't, you still don't really have good evidence of life. Uh, another kind of famous example would be uh, the description by Bill Schopf, a very distinguished, very brilliant Precambrian paleontologist, uh, of uh, these structures that look like uh, microfossils, and in fact he described them as uh, fossil cyanobacteria because they kind of filamentous and kind of segmented from 3.5 billion year old rocks um, from, from the apex cherts, uh, I think in the Pilbara Craton in Western Australia. So Bill Schopf described these as, as fossils. Um, he is one of the world's leading experts on Precambrian fossils, so people were inclined to take him at his word at first. But then it turned out, when other workers looked at the same material, they found a much wider variety of shapes and sizes in these structures. The, all of these are at the same scale. 
than uh, Schopf had originally figured in his paper. And many of these don't actually look like cyanobacteria at all. In fact, they look kind of random with sort of thickenings and thinnings and pinchings and all these different sizes and these rather straight edges inside them. And it began to look like less compelling evidence of, of life than had been thought. And uh, in addition to that, uh, the geological setting where these were found was reinterpreted um, so that whereas Schopf had said that these, form, these were preserved in bedded silica deposits that had formed in a nice habitable environment at the seafloor, they may actually have formed in rather hot hydrothermal veins below the seafloor. And then more recent work shows that these things are actually composed largely of little clay minerals that have delaminated. So the little sheets of the phyllosilicate clay mineral structure have come apart somewhat. Um, and then organic carbon, or carbon anyway, it's now mostly graphite, has kind of filled in the little spaces around them. So you end up with some, by the way, this is not from here, this is just to, to illustrate what the, um, delamination of clay looks like. But this is, is from the apex chart. So it's more or less just a sort of coincidence that the end product of all these processes it looks a bit like fossil bacteria. So again, these were probably not processes that shop for anybody else really knew about or had considered back in 1993. Um, but it turns out that these things are not biological. So the full story here has only emerged relatively recently thanks to relatively modern analytical tools, uh, mapping the chemistry at a very high resolution, for example. Um, so one lesson is to use the best tools we have, of course, but another lesson is not to cherry pick. If you have a population of, of data, don't just show the ones that look most biological. Look at the full, full range of variation before you jump to a conclusion. Okay, another classic example. I, I know there are a lot of these and I'm sorry for the negativity, but okay. Another classic example. So another very brilliant scientist, Fred Hoyle, one of the great physicists of the 20th century, observed that uh, in interstellar dust, there are features, again, in the infrared spectrum that look like organic matter. Uh, and he interpreted these by comparing them with, so I think the, the dots here are the spectrum from interstellar dust, and the line is a spectrum from, from some bacteria. And that was the comparison he made, and he concluded that there were bacteria in space. And he was a big advocate of the panspermia theory that the, the universe is teeming with microorganisms that are raining down on planetary surfaces all the time. Now we understand relatively well now that in fact there is plenty of organic matter in space and it's not necessarily anything to do with life. Maybe these were the building blocks of life. And in fact that's, that's a key lesson here actually. There's plenty of organic matter in the universe. This wasn't very well understood in the mid 20th century but it's relatively well understood now. And the building blocks of life, the components from which life actually originated, can themselves resemble life in ways that can be misleading, including interstellar uh, organic material. Another very recent example, we talked a bit about stromatolites recent, um, earlier in, in this talk. There was a 2016 paper describing some interesting kind of convex structures preserved in uh, metamorphosed carbonate rocks from the issue of Greenstone Belt in Greenland about 3.7 billion years old, and interpreting these as fossil stromatolites because they had that kind of dome-like shape that we saw stromatolites can make. There was some evidence for internal lamination inside these structures, and you see that in real stromatolites. You get these, these layers of sequential generations of the microbial map preserved. And um, this was then contradicted by people who looked at the same rock but included the other dimension and showed that these very convex structures, you only see them in, in, in this plane, but in that plane, you just have these straight lines. So actually these look like little folds uh, rather than domes. Now I am doing, this is a simplification of the real story, which is more complicated. There, there's geochemical evidence involved in this debate as well. And it still is debated whether these things could be stromatolites or not. Um, but I think, I think it was probably a mistake to jump to the conclusion that they were without, without fully characterizing the, the full three-dimensional morphology of the rocks, for example. Uh, just, just another example, not to do with life detection, but to do with uh, a claim of, of detecting a radically different form of life on Earth. Um, there was a study that was announced with a lot of fanfare. There was a NASA press conference which claimed to have found bacteria that were using phosphorus sorry, that we're using arsenic 
instead of phosphorus in their DNA. And it was isolated from this lake, this Lake Mono in California, uh, which is this very extreme environment with a lot of arsenic in the water. When the, the, the other scientists tried to replicate this finding, they found that in fact these bacteria were very good at growing with very, very low levels of, of, of phosphorus, but they weren't using arsenic in, in place of, of phosphorus. Um, and the experiments in which this paper um, had claimed no phosphorus was present, there was actually some phosphorus present, and that's what the bacteria were using. So these bacteria could scavenge phosphate from very, very low concentrations, um, which, which hadn't been picked up on in the analyses. So beware of contamination in your samples, in this case from phosphorus, and beware of the detection limits of your instrumentation. And the controversies continue. Uh, Umuamua, this was this object that came into our solar system, did a slingshot around the sun and then left again with a rather strange trajectory. There's another Harvard astronomer, incidentally, who interprets this as possibly uh, an ext a, a, a spacecraft from another civilization. It's a bit far out, but some people take him seriously. Um, there's also the possible presence of phosphine PH3 in the clouds of Venus, which has been argued to be a biosignature. Now, it's not clear whether the phosphine is really there. Some more recent attempts to detect this have not been able to find any at all. But even if it is there, the claim that it's a biosignature, which is made by analogy with biological production of phosphine on Earth, because most phosphine on Earth is produced by bacteria, that claim relies on an analogy that doesn't really hold up, because the bacteria that make phosphine on Earth could not survive on Venus. So we come all the way back to Huxley in the 19th century. It's not a biosignature if the environment is un uninhabitable, and the clouds of Venus are probably so acidic, the water activity is so low, that this is really not what we would consider a habitable environment, certainly for any organism that we know of that makes phosphine. So I'm not saying it's not life, I just don't think the argument is very good, personally. That's my opinion. So we've got lots of, I mean, I could, I could just talk for another hour about more examples like this. There's lots of these things that at least I would regard as false positives. And there is an element of judgment and opinion in this, and you may disagree with some of the things I've said, and that's fine. But I'm not just trying to be negative, I'm trying to say we can draw some lessons from all of this, and I've tried to do that as we've been going through these examples. It's not a biosignature if the, if the environment's uninhabitable. Don't overinterpret weak signals. Beware of unconceived alternatives to the hypotheses that you consider when you try to evaluate something. You can have multiple lines of evidence that look like life, and it can still be wrong. The building blocks of life, the organic molecules that the universe produces non-biologically, can look a lot like life and beware of contamination in your samples. So I hope those are useful, useful lessons. Uh, science, of course, learns by making mistakes. That's good and proper. But they're still mistakes. What else should we think about if we want to avoid them? Well, one thing I don't want to say is that we should just be extremely skeptical about any claim of extraterrestrial life. I think some people just say, oh, it's never aliens. It's never extraterrestrial life. Forget about it. And I don't think that's a very healthy attitude. Uh, there's this kind of comic uh, abstract that was published, or at least submitted, to the Astrophysics Journal. Title, Is It Aliens? Abstract, No It's Not. <laughs> Which is funny, but is maybe not the most scientific approach to these things. And I would say, okay, we've talked a lot about false positives, but if we always take this approach, then we're going to have some false negatives. We're going to miss out on what could be one of the great discoveries in the history of science, because we were too afraid of being wrong, that we weren't willing to... To, to deal with a hypothesis that maybe makes us a bit uncomfortable. You often hear this, this idea that extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. You, have, you, have you put your hand up if you've heard this? A little under half. Okay. So this was popularized by Carl Sagan, who's already come up at least once, maybe twice, in this presentation. Um, he was a very prominent science communicator and early proponent of astrobiology. Um, and he liked to say extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. And astrobiologists often say this as well. So here I've highlighted this phrase turning up in various papers in astrobiology. The problem with it is it's a little bit unclear what it actually means. I mean, what's, extraordinary, what's an extraordinary claim and what's extraordinary evidence? One way to think about this is if we use Bayes' theorem, uh, uh, then we can see that this, th this must be true just from the, ax the axioms of the probability calculus. The probability that a claim is true given some new evidence 
is equal to the probability that the claim is true multiplied by the probability that the, you would get the new evidence if the claim were true divided by the probability of obtaining that evidence. So in order for the probability of a claim to come out as a high probability given some new evidence, if that claim had very low probability to begin with, to do that you need new evidence that you would only get if the claim was true and you wouldn't get otherwise. So this is a mathematical way of seeing that this expression that Carl Sagan liked to use is actually true in the case that we know that the claim being made has a very low probability. Do we know that the claim extraterrestrial life exists has a very low probability? Or the claim extraterrestrial life doesn't exist? Which of these claims is improbable? I don't think we really know. <laughs> so I don't really think we can just say if somebody's claimed they found extraterrestrial life that it must be an extraordinary claim. That's my opinion, you can disagree of course. Another way to think about this is, when is life actually a viable hypothesis to explain some data? Uh, this is something I wrote a little bit about with, with my colleague Charles and with Jennifer Biddle um, in response to the phosphine controversy. I would suggest that your data may not be a biosignature if the environment is not habitable or if the environment is potentially habitable but where life couldn't actually produce that signature in that environment. And if Otherwise, life might be a hypothesis that you want to consider, even if it's not the most compelling one. I don't think we should just rule it out as being extraordinary. Another way we can think about this problem of false positives is to try to anticipate them by studying the non-biological processes that might generate life-like phenomena. And I sometimes call these false biosignatures. And this is a classic example in the history of geology. You often find, particularly on the bedding plains of limestones, these little dendrites made from manganese minerals. Uh, and people used to just assume that these must be some kind of fossil. And of course, now we understand that they're not a fossil. They are formed by a process of chemical reaction, diffusion, precipitation, which we can actually model very nicely in a very simple algorithm. It's a process called diffusion limited aggregation. Uh, in another version of this talk, this is an animation which plays to show how these structures build up from the random accretion of, of particles that move randomly and then nucleate onto some original core. Um, so this is a process that we can, you can also do this in an electrolysis cell with, with you may have done this at school, you can make dendrites quite easily. Um, so we understand that this isn't biological because we understand the process that actually produces it. Now, there's a whole range of things that we find in the laboratory when we try to simulate various geochemical processes and in nature that look biological, certainly morphologically. And this is an image that shows some examples. I forgot to put the citation on this, but this is from a review that Julie Cosmides and I published a couple of years ago in, in uh, the Journal of the Geological Society. So all of these things here, at least to us, they kind of look lifelike, but none of them is. They're all from chemical reactions in the laboratory or things that we found in nature that we know are not biological. Some of them are made of organic materials, some of them are made of minerals, some of them form under in, in environments that are actually quite habitable and have uh, lots of water, some disequilibrium that drives the chemistry that produces these. Um, so we need to study these kinds of processes. And particularly in geology, we know that you can have patterns forming from what we refer to as self-organization. So just like life, self-organization by which we mean the formation of a, of a pattern just from the internal dynamics of a system, not from some template being imposed, requires disequilibrium, be it thermal or chemical, involves some feedback process and involves transport or growth. And just for the sake of, uh, of illustration, these are some uh, orbital images of the surface of Mars showing patterns that have formed by various kinds of self-organization. So these are spirals, I'm sorry for the lack of scale here, but these are kind of spirals that form in, in, la in lava as it cools. Uh, these sort of spidery structures are thought to have to do with, uh, I think, sublimation of CO2 ice. Uh, these are dunes, these are kind of fossil river valleys. So Mars, being a planet that's not had at least much life interfering with its surface and not much water either for billions of years, uh, 
You can think of Mars as a kind of natural experiment in self-organization and pattern formation that's been running for billions of years. You can see that at the orbital scale. Maybe we'll also, we're also going to see this at the microscopic scale. It remains to be seen. I want to give an example from my own work of, of why I think we should be studying non-biological processes and how they can help us to interpret things that are otherwise liable to be considered biosignatures. So a few years ago in Nature, um, some, so a, a largely British-led team uh, published evidence for early life in Earth's oldest hydrothermal vent precipitates. And they were describing these little tubes made of iron oxide, um, preserved in, in silica again, so in, in a chert rock, um, around four billion years old. The dating is a little uh, imprecise. And they interpreted these little tubes of iron oxide as the remains of iron metabolizing filamentous bacteria, which would make them essentially the oldest fossils on the Earth. And they argued that these formed um, in a hydrothermal setting on the Archean seafloor, and that similar structures should be primary targets in the search for extraterrestrial life. And you can see that a lot of them, there's this kind of central knob, and then you've got these filaments coming out of it. And they argued that no known mechanism can facilitate the growth of multiple tubes from a single hematite knob, that's iron oxide, at varying angles, like you see here, together with the formation of internal coiled, branched, and twisted filaments. So what they're saying is there's no known non-biological process that could make this kind of structure. Unfortunately, that's not true. That There is a chemical process that can make this kind of structure, and it's known as the chemical garden, and it's, it was discovered in 1646. Um, and it's a very simple experiment to do on the bench. And here's the result from one of my experiments showing that if you just dissolve some iron sulfate in an alkaline silica-rich solution, you can make a little knob of iron, actually oxyhydroxide, which very readily transforms into hematite under a little bit of heat, with uh, filaments at varying angles, and sometimes you get filaments inside other filaments. So you can actually do all of this without biology. That doesn't mean these are not fossils, but it does mean there's a, a range of non-biological processes that should have been considered. And again, I'm sorry to be critical. Uh, just to give a few more examples from other areas of astrobiology, we've already talked about oxygen, which traditionally was regarded as something we could rely on as an atmospheric biosignature particularly if it's out of equilibrium with more reduced gases. But we do know that there are pathways that could produce oxygen and ozone in planetary atmospheres that have to do with the photolysis of water by UV light. And we know that in certain planetary systems, we expect the oxygen to accumulate as hydrogen is lost to space. And this can happen even on rocky planets in the habitable zone if enough water is able to accumulate in the, up, in the, in the upper atmosphere. And there's, some, there's various nice papers describing this. What these papers are trying to do, and this is just one example, is explore the possible range of non-biological false biosignatures in advance, as it were, to prevent a repeat of these kinds of mistakes that we've made in the past. So I think that's important work. Uh, also to give a few more examples uh, of some, some recent work describing isotopic anomalies, in this case, uh, from Mars, so Franz et al. 2017 reported very large sulfur isotope fractionations preserved by sulfate and sulfides in Martian sediments at Gale Crater. So this was Curiosity rover. So they did pyrolysis and they looked at the isotopic composition of the, uh, the sulfur that comes out when you do pyrolysis. And they found a spread of isotopic compositions in the sulfur that would be broadly consistent with those produced by terrestrial microbes. But in this case, they didn't jump to the conclusion that these were biological. Instead, they said biogenicity should be invoked as a serious possibility only after all potential abiotic hypotheses have been discounted. And in fact, they, come up, they came up with a model, which is kind of illustrated in this cartoon, that involves slow equilibration in the subsurface uh, between sulfate and sulfide that may be able to generate these fractionations. That model was a little bit ad hoc, um, but... Uh, the effort to, again, explore the probabilities, explore the possibility space for non-biological processes before jumping to the conclusion of biology is, I think, important. And now we're in a similar situation with respect to carbon, because, again, in Gale Crater, Curiosity has detected organic carbonaceous material uh, that has a very, very light carbon isotope composition, which is a bit hard to explain. And, again, this is a paper that tries to do that without resort resorting to biology, but they have to admit in this paper that we don't fully understand the kinds of processes that they 
speculate about, for example, photochemical uh, processes that might generate isotopically light organic compounds. More work is needed to understand them. I want to emphasize again that as we are looking for life on the early Earth or in rocks on Mars that may be four billion years old, we are approaching the age, the probable age, of life itself. And that means we're running into a problem, which is that the origin of life required fairly complex organic material uh, and forms of self-organization as well that would have generated cell-like structures. All of that happened before life itself um, originated. So if you look at the kinds of structures produced by prebiotic systems, according to what the prebiotic chemists are telling us, and the kinds of structures that early life could have produced that might have been preserved in the rock record, there's a lot of overlap. And once you transform that into fossils in the rock record and you lose a lot of information, it really may not be possible to tell anymore whether you're looking at the remains of the earliest forms of life or you're looking at the remains of the kinds of prebiotic chemical systems that gave rise to life. So that's most of what I wanted to say about false positives. Um, just before I finish the talk, I want to say a few more words about false negatives. A general point here is that extreme environments can damage biosignatures, and we've already actually touched on this earlier. The radiation environment on Earth, uh, sorry, on Mars, it's been calculated, would destroy 99.9% .9 of 100 atomic mass unit molecules uh, in about 650 million years within the top few centimeters. This is why we have to get below the surface. Uh, and this is just a graph that shows the uh, sort of ionizing radiation dose me actually measured uh, in Gale Crater. Uh, and essentially it's very high. So um, that's why we need to dig below that or look at material that's only been recently exposed. Otherwise, we're going to just draw, draw a blank. We're going to not, not find evidence of life, even if it was at some point there. To give another, give another example in a different context, we've talked a bit about the, the red edge, this signal of vegetation that, that I showed at the beginning of the talk. This is actually very difficult to see if you just look at the reflectance spectrum of the Earth as a whole rather than focusing in on narrow regions of it, like that Sagan paper did. So here is a spectrum of Earthshine taken from the dark side of the moon, when the light that was being scattered onto the moon came from this face of the Earth. Uh, this is from a nice paper by Sarah Seeger and colleagues. And you can maybe just about make out a little ramp that might, be, that might correspond to the red edge. Um, whereas when the light's coming from the other face, uh, you don't really see anything there, but it's pretty faint. And this is with very, very good uh, spec spectroscopy. Whereas space telescopes, even in the next few decades, that are pointed at exoplanets, won't have spectral resolution as good as this. So we might miss this, even if it's there, at least in the foreseeable future. And this would be another case where actually we could, it, there could be a false negative, because we're just not able to see a feature that's this subtle. Another possible example would be from actually the Viking, so here's Carl Sagan again, standing next to a model of the, one of the Viking landers that went to Mars in the 1970s. As you may know, the Viking landers did a series of biology experiments and they also had uh, an instrument that aimed to detect organic molecules um, by pyrolysis GCMS. And although the results of the biology experiment were kind of ambiguous, uh, the GCMS found no organic molecules, at least that was the interpretation at the time. And so people threw out the results of the biology experiments because it seemed as though, well, if there's no organic material, so that there can't have been life. And these other types of, this sort of interesting chemistry that we saw in the biology experiments must have some other explanation. Many years later, it turned out that, in fact, uh, probably some of the compounds that the pyrolysis GCMS did detect, which were chlorinated hydrocarbons, which were interpreted in the 1970s as contaminants, were not contaminants. And in fact, um, there are perchlorates in the soil on Mars. There's a very small amount of organic matter as well. Not a lot, a small amount. Some of which has reacted with perchlorates, more of which will react with perchlorates in the pyrolysis oven of the instrument. And so if you analyze certain materials on Mars, you will find chlorinated hydrocarbons, largely because of what happens in the pyrolysis process.
but which do in fact derive from organic material on Mars. And aside from that, we now know from other instruments, on Curiosity in particular, that there is organic material preserved in mudstones on Mars. So the interpretation of the Viking GCMS results as negative for, for, for organics was in that sense a false negative. Uh, another very recent paper I want to mention in this context uh, describes uh, some rocks from the Atacama uh, Desert in South America, which are uh, so th th these are the ones from the Atacama, which are quite similar uh, to some sedimentary rocks on Mars. And they study, they look for the presence of microorganisms in this environment. It's a fairly extreme environment by the Earth's standards. And they found that although life was measurably present in this environment on the Earth, the biomass was so low that the instruments on Mars rovers would really struggle to detect it. So again, in extreme environments where you have quite a low biomass able to support itself, it can, you know, life can be present but, but, but below detection limits, even for the latest rover instrumentation. That's one of the conclusions of this, this nice paper which just came out. So we have to worry about false negatives as well as false positives. Okay, so to recap, life detection in astrobiology is challenging. Uh, it's often difficult to tell the difference between evidence of biology and evidence of poorly understood non-biological <coughs> processes. That leads both to false positives, but potentially also to false negatives when we're searching for life. And I think the key is that astrobiologists need to study the non-biological context in which they're looking for life. It's not enough to go out there with your mind just full of biology, because then everything you see you're going to think of as biology. We need to become geologists and geochemists and not just biologists. Only then can we tell the difference reliably between life and non-life. And that's the end of my presentation, so I don't know where I am time-wise. Okay. Thank you. <laughs>